and welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The fifth Sunday of Easter falls on April 28th, 2024. And the texts are these, Acts 8, 26 through 40, Psalm 22, 25 through 31, 1 John 4, 7 through 21, and John 15, 1 through 8. This is True Vine Sunday number one. Indeed. Next week will be True Vine Sunday number two. Number two. Yes. And we have a commentary from a, an up and coming scholar named Caroline Lewis <laughs> here on the website about is it John? The True Vine. True Vine. Yeah. <laughs> Which uses the expression village people. You talk about her village people. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Thanks for noticing. I appreciate that. it about John Four. The Samaritan woman has village people. Cool. Thanks for noticing that. I also, uh, I also like my line: horticultural rabbit holes. Yes. <laughs> Rabbits are notoriously uh, bad pruners. Yes, they're not. Yes, they. I'm exactly. like the vine dresser. Yeah. So this is an interesting image of of the vine and the branches. And largely because it's the idea that there are branches, that each branch is a person, is how I often hear it. Mm. And so some branches are doing great, and they get pruned, and they bear more fruit, and that's great. And there are some branches that are like, you know what, we're going to cut you off and and chuck you out. But plants, <laughs> plants are all connected, right? I mean, they do have a sort, it's not... You know, I don't want to take this too far into a horticultural rabbit hole or any other kind of rabbit hole. But you know, is there isn't there a corporate responsibility that branches bear fruit? Do you know what I mean? Is it just doesn't the overall organism do yeah. that? So it's I guess what I'm saying is this often gets created or gets treated in kind of a binary way as make sure you're one of these good producing branches because if you're not, sorry. Um, but this is about a larger ecosystem of faith, right? Or a larger kind of organic understanding of Christian community. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think... Am I over-interpreting it again? Uh, no, I think one of the things about verse 6 in particular is how it is typically heard as you either be a, you know, a good branch or a bad branch, right? I don't know, whatever. I've heard that. Yeah, but it's really not about that. It's it's not it's not about it. This is a very different tone uh, than, say, for example, Matthew, where you have the, you know, the wheat and the whatever, um, and or <laughs> Matthew can be Matthew's not all bad. No, no, no. I'm not saying that, but uh, that's why I that's why in the commentary I talked about how important it is to put this in a pastoral perspective that this is this is a statement of truth not a statement of judgment right or condemnation i felt that whoever if you don't stay with the branch you die i mean that's just that's that's the truth and so uh but if you stay with if you stay with the i mean if you don't stay with the vine then right. you you die and you can't produce you can't produce fruit and so if you just make that switch to hear it in that in those words of of pastoral words on those words of promise, that's really what I think Jesus is trying to get at here, uh, and and it's not really a, it's not really a moment of, mm, it's certainly not a moment of judgment. It's a statement of truth, and and but that abiding then what Jesus will go on to say is that this is absolutely essential. You're not only with the vine, but you're with all the other branches, and uh, and and that there's no way that the disciples can uh, get through <laughs> the next three chapters, let alone what's coming, without recognizing that connection to the vine and the connection to each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's I think that's the wider uh, that's the wider perspective that you need to have here. Otherwise, it becomes it does become this horticultural rabbit hole that, that the garden gardening processes or, or whatever sort of take over your interpretation. And that, and so, so locating this within the, you know, the wider, 
the wider context of the farewell discourse. And what the disciples really need to hear at this moment is critical. I'm not going to respond because I had a horticultural rabbit hole to go down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something because I'm, you know, I'm that city girl who knows, you know, like you buy me a plant and you just tell the plant you're sending it to me and they'll start to die. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, um, but um, it, I thought this was going to be great with your question, Matt. Uh, in the sense that a part of pruning, so I've learned, is um, kind of a, a shaping, you know, that um, to collectively um, you prune it so that it, it has a certain appearance um, or um, it, um, it only covers this much space. Um, and in that way, it becomes a collective unit a collective expression. And that's all I'm going to say about that because I was really convinced by what Caroline said in terms of keeping it. Um, and I th truly, the truth of it is that apart from the vine, we die. I, you know, I find myself in, in many spaces now where people are saying, well, there's good from people who aren't a part of this Jesus people. And yes, there is, but where do we get this idea of good from? And I think we get this idea of good that we long from, we, that it, it is the promise of God demonstrated in Jesus. And so to be a part of that vine, to, um, to recognize that apart from Jesus, I'm not going to have that good. Mm -hmm. uh, or it'll be like, I'm, I'm having fun because I got I got some flowers uh, a couple of weeks back for my birthday and they're still alive. And uh, I was thinking I might put them behind me because by the time this airs, it'll be so far away from my birthday that the people that gave them from me will think it's a miracle that they're still alive um, because they're not a part of the vine. And they're not, I mean, even with the water, they're not going to keep, you know, alive. And that's just, true as you said Carol well I think the other uh, the other thing here is is to recognize that uh, again our sort of assumptions about you know, our sort of horticultural assumptions where you know and it's true with the shepherd discourse right we we tend to have these like you know well Jesus is working out this image of the vine and the branches or John is working them out whatever uh but but it's always modified, right? It's always through this lens of it, it, you're not mapping metaphor onto, you know, onto something. And then you have to, you have, you have to follow that metaphor to its very end. Right. And so, so verse two, he removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That word prunes is the same word as cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, so what does pruning really mean here? <laughs> and, and that's why I go back to that pastoral, uh, that pastoral claim is that to, because to be, to be clean is to abide in Jesus. I mean, it really kind of goes back to, it really kind of goes back to the foot washing. It's kind of an illusion. Back uh, to the washing. Uh. You know, if I don't wash you. You don't have a share with me. Yeah. And so and so we we just have to take all of these words and like say yeah but what's John up to here, and um and that's why it you already you already have been cleansed you already this is not about you're gonna get you know you're gonna get cut off you're gonna get pruned you already have been cleansed you already are you are the branches and this is a promise of of truth and uh, comfort uh, and uh, so yeah that's another. I think another distinction that's worth mentioning here. Let's be pastoral. <laughs> well, and it's, I mean, it's, I, as I talk about in the commentary, I, you know, it's the only I am with a you are. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and again, that claim of identity for the disciples and, and again, looking forward, what, what, what are they going to be, what are they going to hold on to, uh, as as the words get as the word gets words get more troubling and more troubling and more troubling mm -hmm. 
the closer we get to the arrest and then the arrest and everything. And so uh, that, and when you think about that, the I am statements that this is the, you know, the last I am statement with the predicate nominative. So the entirety of those predicate nominatives, I am, I am should be behind this. I'm your sustenance. I'm your bread. I'm your water. I'm your life. I'm your, I'm everything. And so, and you are the branches. So it's just, it's a, uh, it's such an extraordinary promise of identity. We could even use belonging, but it's uh, that of of who they are, and that's not going to change no matter what happens, even death, even resurrection. <laughs> that uh, because you know we've come off of fourteen two. In my father's house, there are many abodes. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm preparing that place for you, and so it just kind of. You know, it just keeps cycling back to, circling back to that promise. I will not leave you. I will never leave you. That's, and I find that to be really, really meaningful. And reading this uh, uh, in the post-resurrection accounts, uh, reading this uh, after the resurrection, these are the things that um, Jesus said and they remembered uh, as uh, John will end uh, in, in John 20, 31, there's many other things that Jesus said and did uh, that he doesn't record. Uh, but these things are recorded that you might believe that, that this resurrection brings to mind all of these accounts of how their identity is that they are part of this community of witnesses. And so reading this text, um, remembering these words after the resurrection becomes an assurance of all that has been promised. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And I think you say that, but that might be your commentary next week. <laughs> <laughs> I may have gotten ahead of you. Should we talk about Acts? Great story. Ethiopian eunuch and a really, really fine commentary yes. by Scott Spencer on the website. So I would I would direct people to that as well. Um, even if you're not preaching on the Ethiopian eunuch, it's just a it's a great it's a fun read. Mm-hmm. It's a mm-hmm. great read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, what a story. Yeah, and the first of two, right? If next week you're gonna have a shorter passage, but it's going to be the spirit coming to Cornelius and his household. So you've got in Acts 8 through 10, you've got a bunch of astounding conversions with mm-hmm. um, the Samaritans, the Ethiopian, Paul, and then Cornelius all all in a row. So we get two of those. Yeah, it's, you know, part of what's going on is the 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 church in this case philip they're undergoing uh they're crossing into these new horizons that require them to learn or to discover who is or who is not quote unquote acceptable and the answer is Mm -hmm. there are no criteria for who is or is not acceptable nobody has to change Mm-hmm. or assimilate to join this new community of God's salvation. And yeah. what Scott does so well in his commentary is point out all the ways in which this Ethiopian court official does not easily fit into any kind of a box. Mm-hmm. There are huge debates about whether or not he's a Jew or a Gentile. Nobody debates the fact that he's wealthy and powerful, but probably also enslaved, and that his uh, status as a eunuch really makes him... I mean, oddity is too simple of a word, really of a, a source of scorn from the perspective, at least of a lot of Greco-Roman masculinity mm-hmm. as well. So here's this pathetic, weird, almost non-human person from the perspective of some yeah. who is deeply insightful, who appears to be deeply pious, but who also is, um, he's more powerful than Cornelius in chapter 10, who's a Roman centurion in terms of his own context, right? So it's, it defies all of our attempts to create either ors, mm-hmm. right? Or a simple identifying, a simple kind of what kind of box shall I put you in so I can know who you are and know whether you belong or not. And he just refuses to be <laughs> to be put into any single box. Like it's true with most people. 
One of the things that uh, just reading a little bit about um, the privilege and position uh, I had not paid attention to until I was preparing for for this uh, podcast is that so often we forget that, uh, or, or so often when we read, we read about those who are of lower status, um, the outsider of lower status that is being invited in. And uh, as you just noted, um, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch actually has higher status than Cornelius the uh, centurion. Um, and so this becomes, uh, and the commentary points this out, a person who has such privilege, um, some of that privilege granted because they um, maybe are willing to have uh, taken on this status to serve, to, to be a trusted servant at this level. Um, and so um, this is not just a person who would be outcast because of the uh, ideologies of, of um, masculinity, but like you said, it's not just a simple either or binary. This is a person who, because they have made this choice, has actually given themselves a level of status and privilege um, that maybe sometimes we need to allow to be a part of the kingdom as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, I sometimes have told uh, my first appointment in the United Methodist Church, I was on staff at a large downtown first church, which it's almost synonymous with the um, snooty congregation in a town, you know, not the clapboard church out in the country, but the brick church in the city, city center. And um, I had taken literally the idea that, you know, a rich man can't get to heaven because you can't thread a, you know, a, a needle with a camel. And um, God told me there that people with privilege People with resources belong to me too. Wow. <laughs> Maybe that's another way of reading mm-hmm. of this story, not to read the Ethiopian, the African, the eunuch, but to read the positioned, the powerful as being accepted equally. Yeah. And I think too, what this story does, especially back to back with Cornelius for next week, is it just blurs all of those, uh, blurs all of the boundaries or all of the stipulations that we put on who who is in and who is out. And so, you know, that, that I love this line in the commentary. So Midday in the middle of the Gaza desert, Philip encounters a wealthy chariot riding, God fearing, Bible reading African official. Just another day in the life of a Christ evangelist with another wrinkle that's really the main feature, right? So it's, you know, you have it's it's that's just such a great line, but it but there's just no easy there's just no easy categories that we would place on who's in and who's out. And so then why, you know, why God truly, I know God shows no partiality. And I, uh, I, I think that really is worth a lot of, mm, a lot of homiletical weight uh, with a text like this and next week. And, and how is it that, uh, you know, what are the categories that we place on people or expectations of people that, that, that make them in or out? Um, and, and, you know, and then the question is, is for the Ethiopian eunuch, what's to prevent me? Mm -hmm. Well, let's name all those what's, (laughs) let's let's just name all those what's that prevent so many people from knowing the love of God. That's a profound moment. Um, because the, uh, we don't know what Philip says. So the, the, the narrator, the narrator keeps from us. Philip's explanation of the good news. So we know the Isaiah text, uh, as Scott points out, that comment, do you understand what you're reading, isn't as offensive as it might sound in English. But then we don't know. But what we do know is that the Ethiopian himself is the one who has made the theological jump to like, water, what is to prevent me from being baptized is a rhetorical question, right? In other words, you know, nothing. So he's he's realized that the gospel is uh, for him. And it's funny, there's a verse 37 that was there in the King James, and we, we now realize it was a later edition from scribes, where Philip kind of lays out the rules, like, well, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's funny, right, that 
in the history of, of transmission of this passage, it has made people nervous that there appear to be no criteria for this man's salvation that he has to be instructed in. And so they've added one, which is mm -hmm. on one hand, a shame, but on the other hand, kind of like it, it illustrates the way in which there is a kind of, maybe not an offense, but certainly a surprise in this story. And I love that it's the man's own agency or the man's own theological insight that that makes that last step uh, to his baptism. So a really important passage that should blow your mind. It's, it's, it's supposed to be almost like a dream because it's just so like, really, like what Scott says, it's another day in the life, right? You know, all of the coincidence, all of the strangeness, yeah. uh, all the way in which the story kind of pushes the extent of expectation and almost credibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we, don't add 37, the verse 35 at least makes it clear that to understand what this good news is, is made clear in God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That Jesus' demonstration of good is what makes all of these prophetic um, promises possible. From that Isaiah text, you mean? Like, yes. So, yeah. Yes. So yeah, if you've never preached on this, you have to sometime before you're done. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, on a passage like this. And a really important passage, I think, has been helpful in a lot of recent debates about helping the church become more inclusive, as is the Cornelius story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from there to Psalm 22, which I wasn't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> You weren't expecting? No. Well, I mean, James Howell is comment, or it was not, James Howell points out like, you know, how odd during Easter to return to this Psalm, but you know, it's, okay. it's the, it's, it's not the beginning of the Psalm. How about that? No. Mm -mm. Um, and this notion of all families of the, of the nations shall worship before him. I mean, there's mm -hmm. Acts never tells us what the quote unquote ends of the earth are from chapter one, verse eight, but the Ethiopian appears to embody that from a Greco-Roman point of view. If that's the center exactly. of your universe, then this man exactly. appears to be uh, from the outlying edges uh, and is is a crucial figure. Now I'm back to Acts, right? Yes, um, I know. I, about 15 years ago, I met with a bunch of Sudanese immigrant pastors in Minneapolis, and we just talked about the Ethiopian the entire time because that was that was where they saw their link to their church in the Bible. Like, this is the man who... Mm. brought the gospel to where we live and mm. something powerful about that so in in the psalm it just sounds like oh yeah we hear this all the time but all the families of the nation shall worship before him i mm -hmm. mean how does that happen mm -hmm. a bridge has got to be built or a link has got to be built grace has got to be extended yeah and that's that's where i was going with the psalm too is making those connections all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the lord uh, and so the, and as you said, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him that it gives you, again, gives you language for thinking about what that expansion means, that there's no partiality. And I, I, I read that, uh, 27 along with verse 26, uh, this, uh, for me goes back to how we've been talking about being a part of the community of witness or uh, community of witnesses. Um, those who seek him shall praise him. Um, their um, seeking will result in action. And that's exactly what we see um, uh, with, the, um, with the Ethiopian, um, that there's a seeking to understand, clarity is brought to him, and he becomes um, the witness. He becomes, uh, you know, you took us back to Acts. Um, he becomes the one that becomes that link uh, to the community of witnesses. All right. Continuing on in First John, and this is going to sound really obvious, and we and we hear it so often. But the the claim in verse eight, for God is love. Right. I mean, that's just so simple yet so incredibly profound. And so what does that, I mean, and this, of course, this section is really focusing on um, what that, what that love means and, uh, and, and particularly how that love gets carried out and gets embodied. Uh, and 
and then also the fact that that connection to to verse 12 of no one has ever seen god but it's possible to see god then and in how we love one another uh, and that we'll get glimpses of god in how we express that love to one another and that's that's really um that's a lot, <laughs> you know, that's really, that's worth, I, that's worth a, a, a exploring in a sermon, I think, especially when, uh, especially with how, you know, this, this, this idea gets co-opted, God is love, but then what are we, are we really, are we really exploring the depth of what that means then for, for our behavior and for the identity of the church and how the church behaves and how we behave as as communities of the extension of the church and and whatever whatever extensions of the church that might be whether it's congregations synodical and judicatory bodies institutions uh, such as seminaries and colleges I mean it's yeah. It's it's such a wonderful chapter where it has that line in there that sounds like a noun, God is love. The whole of these verses are the active demonstration of what then is love. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it, it, um, it pushes us beyond the circular reasoning that God is love and love is God. Because here we see, well... Mm-hmm. That glimpse, I, I, I always love it when we use that word, uh, that glimpse that allows others to know that there is a God who is good. Um, and it's when I see glimpses of this goodness over and over again uh, that I can have hope that I belong and in belonging, I can bear witness to this God. Yeah, so much in here. There's so many sentences that can carry an entire sermon if mm-hmm. you want to just pick one and and build on that and and you both have named some some great sentences or some great starting places or just the the theological grammar you know of this paragraph is so powerful the connection to fear also matters a lot uh, mm-hmm. to me about love that casts out fear i uh, i hear from so many people who still carry fear in their experience in church mm-hmm. or from their experience in church um, and not necessarily like fear of damnation or punishment, although that's some of it, but just fear of asking questions, fear of being open and honest about one's doubts, and to talk about a community of love that actually drives away fear or just um, dissolves it mm-hmm. is worth thinking about. Mm-hmm. And so what does it mean for for love to manifest itself in a particular way that we can break the back of fear. I think so much fear is driving uh, modern society right now too, about future, about strangers, about change or not change. Um, And so not to be Pollyanna about that, but to talk about what is, what does an alternate community look like that's founded on the love of God manifest in, in, in cross and resurrection. Mm 